I've been writing about food now for about 10 years. I've been lucky enough to travel around the world and eat some of the world's greatest dishes, to sample some of the world's finest wines. But for me, food is all about entertaining. It's about looking after people. It's about cooking for people at home and making them happy. But there's one thing that I haven't quite got right yet, and that's those after-dinner, after-dark luxuries. Fortunately, I know some of the right people, experts who are going to help advise me about the finest cigars, the best chocolate, and the greatest after-dinner drinks. In this program, I'm going to go on a journey, a journey to discover the ultimate in after-dinner luxuries and to hear firsthand from some of London's, indeed the world's, most knowledgeable and respected authorities, who I hope will advise and help me to find the greatest cigar the most exquisite chocolate and the finest bottle of port, all of which together, I'm hoping, will make the perfect end to a memorable evening with friends and family. And with luck, I'm going to be able to sample some of these incredible pleasures. So here I am at the start of my journey. I'm in High Street Kensington in London, and I'm looking for the world's greatest after-dinner, after-dark luxuries. Now alongside my cigar and maybe my port, I need some good chocolate which is why I'm about to check into Hotel Chocolat and meet its managing director and co-founder. Now, he's a man who has such a passion for chocolate that he actually went as far as buying a cocoa plantation in St Lucia. In recent years, interest in chocolate has soared and it's now discussed as if it were fine wine. The market in high-end chocolate is rising 20% per year and it's a trend that's set to continue for quite some time. So here I am at Hotel Chocolat with Angus Thurwell. He's the managing director and co-founder. Tell me, Angus, where did you come up with the name from? I mean, how did that work? We wanted to have a name that was very um, escapist. And right. uh, most people's idea of a hotel is that it's a place you go to have a bit of fun. Right. Sounds like my kind of place because my mission is one of escapism. Um, I'm looking for the perfect chocolate that's going to match uh, my cigars, some port, and I'm told you're the man to talk to. Now, I understand you actually have a farm in St Lucia, is that right? That's absolutely right. We can actually make chocolate from literally the beans that we've nurtured from, from, from zero and be very, very careful about all stages to make sure the taste is um, optimised. There's a lot of buzz in the media these days. I mean, there's, there's so much around. There's, you know, there's cocoa beans, there's fair trade, there's, you know, histories of provenance. It's a bit like wine, isn't it? So can you kind of steer me, you know, in the right direction here? Certainly can. I think the, the, the important thing is to try and uh, match the chocolate with the mood, particularly after dinner. People are going to be feeling sort of relaxed, languorous, Maybe some people are sort of a bit overexcited and you're going to have to mix and match the chocolate to suit their mood. And because of that explosion in, in chocolate recipes and, and bean type that's, that's occurred, it's now possible to do that. So try one of these little ones here. This is our um, Rabo State 72% dark. Right. So 72%, which means there is 72% cocoa. cocoa yeah which is a mixture of the cocoa butter and the cocoa liquor. In order to allow the full flavor notes to explode out, we don't put any vanilla in, and we don't use anything else called soya lecithin, which is, um, it's, it's a natural material, but it allows the chocolate to sort of be more fluid. So let's have a look at the 52% milk. So that's quite interesting because you don't really think of milk chocolate as having a, a high percentage or even a 50% you know, degree of, of chocolate, cocoa in it, do you? No, we don't. And the, the reason we created these recipes was to, to try and provide a bridge from most people's perception of milk chocolate and the high cocoa recipes right, that everybody yeah. yearns to get to. And by adding a little dash of milkiness into the recipe, it's a bit like having a macchiato rather than espresso. That little dash of milk just rounds the edges off and makes it a lot more mellow as an experience, which could suit the type of escapism you're looking for for your after-dinner digestif. So just help steer me in the right direction as I try and look for the ultimate chocolate. I'm going to have a, a vintage port, a big fat cigar, and I need the perfect chocolate to match those things. What, what, what do you suggest? I, I'd say the perfect one would be uh, you need quite punchy flavour notes to get through the t tobacco and, and, the, and, the, and the sweetness of, of the vintage port. So I would go for our 72% Rabo Estate uh, chocolate, which is this one here. That's the one that we, yeah. yeah. And um, in, in our tasting notes, we say look out for um, a, a certain degree of spiciness. It's, got a, it's a chocolate with a very big personality. I think it would be more than a match for the, the two other partners that you picked there. I'd recommend not eating very much of it. It's, it's an extremely powerful chocolate. I'd take a, a small, small square, about 
um, that sort of size okay. and allow it to uh, melt in your mouth and, and that should really be enough. Well, thank you very much, Angus. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot and uh, I think I'll take with me some of that 72% Rabo Estate chocolate to go with my vintage port and I'll think about the, uh, the farm and the factory that you've got in St Lucia as I uh, munch away at it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, William. The next leg of my journey takes me to St James in the heart of London where I'm going to start by looking for a perfect after-dinner cigar. Now sales of cigars are up massively around the world. There are celebrity cigar parties, there are cigar magazines and here in St James's Street in London is one of the capital's oldest and best cigar shops and it's through these hallowed doors that on the 9th of August 1900 one of the world's most famous cigar smokers walked in and opened his first account. Of course, that man was Winston Churchill, who reputedly puffed his way through about 10 cigars a day. And the shop is James J. Fox and Robert Lewis. Now, today, Cuba exports over 150 million cigars a year, and it's a global industry worth 3.8 billion euros. Now, you know, one of the first things you notice when you walk into this amazing room is this incredible aroma. That and the fact that around me, are literally thousands of some of the world's greatest cigars. Now come with me downstairs because you know there's an amazing museum down there full of little trinkets all associated with the world of cigars and some wonderful stories as well. One thing's caught my eye. It's absolutely wonderful, a lovely piece of history. I'll read it to you. It's a letter written by Winston Churchill's private secretary in 1963. Here goes. Dear Sirs, confirming our telephone conversation, Sir Winston Churchill would be much obliged if you would send a box of 25 cigars of good quality, but not quite as good as the Romeo and Juliet, and of medium size, to his grandson for his birthday on October the 10th. I enclose a note to go with the parcel. Well, here I am in the great man's chair. There's only one thing missing, and that's for me to actually have a cigar. But before I do that, I'm gonna nip up St. James's Street and walk into Davidoff, another wonderful cigar shop, and I'm gonna meet Edward Saharkin, one of the world's greatest cigar experts. I have to admit that I'm particularly excited about meeting Edward Saharkin, who opened Davidoff of London 28 years ago. What he doesn't know about cigars simply isn't worth knowing. Good evening, Julia. Nice to you? see you. Well, what an amazing shop. Can you show me around? With greatest of pleasure. Let's start from the cigar room, right at the back. OK. Wow, what a smell. What an incredible well, room. You entered our cigar room. We have approximately 70% humidity and the temperature is about 20 to 22 degrees centigrade. What is it about a cigar that demands that sort of humidity and that temperature? At that temperature and at that humidity, the leaves continue the process of fermentation. Okay. And they mature, they ferment very much like wine. And uh, obviously, the longer you keep a cigar under these conditions, it will only get better and more valuable. And I notice here a little sign saying, fine, rare, vintage Havana cigars. Is this the sort of, you know, the creme de la creme of cigars? Are these very expensive? They are. They are these are, this is my little treasures here. Okay. <laughs> these are cigars where you can't uh, find any more in shops. There are some beautiful cigars. They are all matured. They have a good 10, 15, some of them 20 years age on them. They are expensive, but uh, really they're not expensive because uh, when you're smoking a cigar which you enjoy, you can't put value on it. And what sort of people are coming into the shop? When I opened the shop uh, 28 years ago, the average age was 50 plus, and now it has come down to the mid 30s. Right. It's probably uh, a good sign because people are enjoying the good things in life at a younger age right. now. Now, most people think of cigars as Cuban, but I mean, obviously, there are other countries that are supplying cigars. Absolutely. Uh, there is the Dominican Republic. They export in the region of 325 million cigars a year. Whereas from Cuba at the moment, their export is no more than 150 million cigars. Uh, tobacco and cigars coming out from Dominican Republic 
are generally considered much lighter, milder, easier to smoke. With the Cuban tobacco, I'm talking about the finest of their production, like the Cohibas. The flavor of the cigar is full flavor, strong, powerful, and definitely it's for a cigar smoker with experience. What is it about Cohiba? Why have they become so successful? Cohiba brand is a very recent brand. It was made popular by this cigar, the Cohiba Lancero, which is allegedly the cigar that Castro used to smoke for years. Of course, then it didn't have the band on it. And it's made from the finest of the tobacco coming out of Cuba. The first round of selection of tobacco always goes to the Cohiba factory. I know it's a lot of money to pay just under a thousand pounds for a box, but to pay 40 pounds for one good cigar and share it, uh, possibly with one or two friends in the evening, it's a wonderful experience. Now, we've been talking about cigars for quite a long time now, and uh, I feel I'm just about in reach of one. Uh, what can you recommend if I was going to have a smoke now with you? As we haven't had anything substantial to eat, possibly to go for a Cohiba Corona Special. Okay, well, something quite, you really, not something nice, big and fat and long like that one? Maybe. We could, uh, <laughs> as we're going to sample it in any case, because we're not allowed to smoke in the shop. Well, you, you and know. we're going to talk about that, aren't we're we? We're going to yeah. sample that, so we might as well sample this one, yeah. why not? Or we could sample both of them. Excellent. Well, let's go and do some sampling. Now, Edward, before we actually finally light up a cigar, and I can't wait, if I'm not mistaken, there is a smoking ban currently in place in the UK. Oh, well, your concern is justified, but worry not. You are allowed to sample a cigar, not to smoke it, but sample it. And so you have to be very serious, yeah. no smile on right. your face, exactly. And when we've sampled one, could we sample another? <laughs> we could just keep on sampling until time immemorial, until we find the right one. Right, okay. But then well. we have to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, obviously, before you light a cigar, you've got to cut it. Can you show me what you recommend and how you would do it? It's important to cut the end of the cigar, bringing the two ends equal to each other. That's okay. very important. And hence, you could see I'm going to cut it right where the curve starts. So, do you use a lighter or can you use a match? Ideally, uh, matches, wooden matches, without any sulfur on it. But whatever you do, please don't ever use a petrol lighter lighting a cigar. So let's think about a wonderful dinner, some great port, very high quality chocolates. Uh, what should the cigar be to complement that? For the regular smoker, I'd strongly suggest a Cohiba Double Corona Limited Edition. And for an occasional smoker to join into the crowd, possibly a Davidoff Millennium Churchill, which is a large cigar. It will keep up with the rest of the boys, but it doesn't have all that powerhouse. It's much smoother, easier to enjoy. Now, Edward, we've heard you give wonderful advice about what I should be able to smoke, your customers can smoke, but what about the main man? What do you like to smoke, and what's your perfect cigar? Hoya de Monterey Double Corona Cigar from a cabinet selection. Okay. And that'll last you well into the night? That will last me well into the night. It will take me a good two hours to enjoy, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Excellent. Edward, I'm quite interested in, in buying a, a humidor. I see there's one here with Fidel Castro's name scrawled on the inside of the lid. Tell me about this box and where, where does this come from? Well, this is made for the 30th anniversary of the Cohiba. And uh, this box should put you back probably around 35,000 pounds. Okay. And how did you come across it? How did you get Fidel to sign it? Well, Fidel had signed it and it was auctioned for a children's charity in Cuba and I was very fortunate to be able to be the lucky uh, winner of that. Another scroll by Fidel, I assume. Yes, what have we got another special box of 50 cigars. The box itself is worth a lot because, again, it has the signature of Fidel Castro and dated October 10th, 1994. Well, Edward, thank you very much for showing me around this wonderful shop. It's been a pleasure, William. And the last piece of advice, always remember, when you're smoking a cigar, you're smoking an instrument of pleasure. Enjoy it. Wonderful. I will. Thank you.
Coming up later, my journey continues as I meet Britain's top chocolatier and I visit what is probably the world's oldest wine merchant. So far, my journey to find the ultimate after-dinner luxuries has taken me to London's Kensington and to the exclusive St James's Street, where I discovered my perfect cigar. However, I want to sample some more chocolate and, if possible, find and taste one of the world's finest bottles of vintage port. Earlier in my search, I found some fabulous plain chocolate, but I want to go one step further, so I'm going to meet Gerard Coleman of L'Artisan du Chocolat. Now this man supplies chefs like Gordon Ramsay and Heston Blumenthal, which to me makes him possibly the top chocolatier in Britain. From his beautiful boutique in London's Chelsea, Gerard pushes the boundaries with creations such as chocolate flavoured with tobacco. But I'm going to meet him where the magic happens, at his production house in Kent. I'm just fascinated to find out how you make a chocolate. Where does it all start? Where does it begin? Well, instead of having amazing displays, you have amazing smells and right. amazing uh, ingredients, and that's the key to it, it's the raw materials. Most of the chocolate makers we see in this country are people who bring in ready-made chocolate and they will melt down, change into a finished product. We don't grow cocoa beans in this country, so yeah. we're limited as to how far back we actually can go. But um, we want to have as much control as we can ourselves, so for that reason we try to buy in beans, paste, refine conge, and mix ourselves. Now you obviously supply high-end restaurants, and a little bird tells me that you could probably account for about 15 Michelin stars. That's 15 Michelin stars of the chefs, but yes, it's nice to be associated with them. I'm looking for the perfect after dark, after dinner chocolate. This is my mission. I need to find the perfect chocolate that I can enjoy, share with my friends after dinner. So what, what do you suggest? It's just something simple. For teas and coffees, you want a, a nice distinctive taste. For something sweeter, maybe a mint chocolate. So you've got two uh, shapes of chocolate here. Are they just both the same? Same, yeah. Created uh, bespokely for a different environment. A very thin disc, sometimes a nice complement at the end of a meal. A larger square chocolate is um, a nice complement in a box where you have different flavours. You have a chance to try more of it. Okay. The traditional disc is what we're, uh, we usually are familiar with at the end of a nice meal. You don't want so much chocolate, but you want an intense flavour. So I'm going to try this, um, this one here. Ganache. We've got a soft centre mint ganache, which is made up of cream, fresh mint leaves, sugar, uh, a combination of chocolate that we make that works mm. best with that mint flavour. It does taste incredibly fresh. I mean, I could just eat those throughout the night. I'm sure you get sick of them at some stage, but you no, could. <laughs> you could. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just talk about the vulgar concept of cost? Because obviously, you know, there's a lot of talk about chocolate these days. And when someone goes into a shop like yours, um, you might be surprised about how much you might have to pay for chocolate. If you start with a raw material that needs to be nurtured correctly from a, the source, you inherently have to pay more to the growth. If you want a cheap commodity, then you'll buy it a stock market prices as cheap as possible but with cocoa beans if you inherently want a, a better tasting product from the plantation you have mm. to pay more to the farmer to grow it. So Jared, if I wanted to have a little selection of chocolates to go with my cigar and my let's say port mm -hmm. what's that going to cost me? Each one is probably going to be between 80 and 90p. Okay it's about sort of um, 40p. Uh, You've just eaten? I've eaten 40 pence. Yes. Money very well spent, I would say. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about the very finest chocolate in the world, and we're buying your experience, we're buying that provenance. Yes. And actually, ATP for that kind of sensational flavour, which is, you know, miles up what you might call the Epicurean escalator <laughs> from your average bar of chocolate. Yes. I mean, I, I think that's it's well within reach of many people's pockets. Yeah, it has a pure taste. It's a pure source of ingredients. It's not a mix of uh, adulterated, um, cheap commodities. Yeah. And let me just remind myself of um, just how, of how good, good they are. 
Mm. Well, Gerard, thank you very much indeed. And uh, before I leave, there's just one thing I need, and that's a, a box of chocolates. <laughs> All mint or an assortment? A mint, an assortment, and just bring it on. You least have to try something <laughs> else. OK, pleasure. Thank you very much. In recent years, port has been given a bit of a bad name. It's usually the last drink of the evening and so is often blamed for the following morning's hangover. But I think that's a little unfair. To me, port is one of the greatest after-dinner drinks, of which there are several kinds, from tawny to white. But of course, the best is vintage, and I want to find a bottle of the very finest. Now, just a short walk down the road from Fortnum and Mason's, and we come to Berry Brothers and Rudd. It's probably the world's most ancient wine merchant. It was founded in 1698, and it's here that I'm hoping to find the perfect after-dinner drink to go with my cigar and my chocolate. Deep beneath us in the ancient cellar lie hundreds, if not thousands, of some of the world's finest wines and spirits. Now, I know it's a little bit early to start drinking, but I'm hoping that the wine buyer for Berry Brothers and Rudd, Simon Field, is going to let me sample some of these incredible drinks. Well, Simon, thank you very much for allowing us into these hallowed vaults Great pleasure. deep beneath the Welcome. ground in, uh, in St. James's. So tell me, if I was just to ask you for your personal recommendation in terms of the perfect after-dinner drink, what would you go for yourself? For me, it's always got to be port. Right. Beautiful sweetness of flavour, every time. So tell me a little bit about vintage port as opposed to non-vintage. On St George's Day, every year, or every relevant year, they make a declaration of a year, two years previously, that they consider to be worthy of a vintage status. It only happens three times a decade, sometimes fewer. So this is a Coburn's 19... 67, that was not a Berry's bottling. 66 was the generally declared year um, in port. Coburn's decided to wait till 67. It's a bit like comparing Chateau Margaux 83 with 82. A lot of people wondered why Chateau Margaux 83 has such a good reputation. If you taste it, you know why. Uh, Coburn's 67 is one of the most famous ports from that decade. So they rather buck the trend by declaring a year after most of the other port houses have declared. Absolutely. Uh, Coburn's have had a, a slightly checkered history. Um, a lot of people know Coburn's these days from Coburn's Finest Reserve, which is a basic ruby port. In the 60s, they were, along with Dow's and Wars and Taylor's and Naval, they were one of the leading houses. And the 67 Coburn is recognised as one of the leading ports right. of that decade. So do you think you need to decant every bottle of port? Absolutely not. The vast majority of port that is made is for early drinking. However, the ones that have been matured in bottle over a long period of time, they will uh, form a sediment that uh, needs to be decanted and it's fundamental, otherwise the, the drink is ruined. Right. So can you show me how to decant a bottle properly, please? Absolutely. So this, until uh, a couple of hours ago, has been lying on its side. It's fundamental to keep the bottle on its side because you uh, allow contact with the cork, with the liquid, and the uh, cork does not dry out and there is not too much evaporation. Um, a couple of hours ago, we stood it upright so all the sediment would go to the bottom. Now, the task is to uh, extract all the wine without getting any sediment at all into the decanter. And just have to be extremely careful here. All the time, you're checking, and you can see a little bit of sediment coming onto the gauze there. Well, Simon, the anticipation is getting to me. Can I have a drink, please? Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> uh, you and me both, William. <laughs> it's, it's very, very elegant. It almost takes on a, a feminine charm. You have the, the red fruit in the background. You're almost getting notes of leather, figs and cloves. I think it's a perfect vintage port. Uh, the colour is quite delicate. It's all in the elegance now. A young vintage port is quite fiery, quite brutal. This is classic vintage port from a classic era and it's perfectly our point now, drinking really well. Would this have been trod by foot? Absolutely. There'll be a team of about 40 people who go up and down, accompanied by music, for about two or three hours. I've done it. It's great fun. You get almost intoxicated by the atmosphere, and they have someone playing the pipes. They're called rogas. They're teams, and they go up and down, backwards and forwards, for a couple of hours, and then all hell breaks loose. The, 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 uh, the rhythm um, is lost, and they're allowed a sort of free reign to dance around and everyone has a very good time. 
Now, Simon, much as I'd like to work our way gently through that decanter... We're doing quite well. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the world's greatest ports. What will this set me back? Well, the good news is that this only costs... Uh, retails at £70 a bottle, which is quite extraordinary. If you compare that to the fine claret market or the fine burgundy market, this is the equivalent of a first growth in Bordeaux. A first growth in Bordeaux from a top vintage in the 60s, such as 1966, would be selling for thousands of pounds. To be able to get this £70 is an absolute bargain and a real reflection of the fact that the port market hasn't been quite as lively as the Bordeaux market and therefore you can get some real bargains. Well, Simon, I think you've really helped me find the perfect after-dinner drink. Great. So, thank you very much indeed. Great pleasure. Thank you very much. So there we have it. Advice from the experts about choosing the perfect after-dinner, after-dark luxuries. Magnificent cigars, amazing port and perfect after-dinner chocolate. And you know, none of this stuff is wildly out of reach. None of this will break the bank. And personally, I just can't wait to take all of this lot home because I know it'll really round off the perfect evening.